Welcome back. So a few weeks ago, I had a call with Options AI, the hottest new broker on the market, the best broker out for options selling. I guarantee you their visuals will rock you. I had a wonderful call with them. I think it was one of the best interviews that I've done dealing with a guy who owns a brokerage who was a market maker for over 20 years. Check this out. Today, I've got an interesting guest. Uh, this is Max Heaney. His channel on YouTube is Max Options Trading. And he's got a particular style. And again, uh, as a caveat, we are interviewing traders on this program. Not every trading style will be exactly for your purposes. So you have to do your own research. You have to see what kind of trading you are comfortable with. And hopefully, this kind of conversation can add to your arsenal. So I want to introduce Max. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. So tell me, tell me a little bit about your background in trading, how you got into trading, and then how you got into options trading, and then how yeah. you got into your you know particular style of options trading. Yeah, definitely. So I started, I'm going on six years full-time now as a full-time options trader. Um, I used to, when I would just got out of the military 2018, I was always trading shares. As I was trading shares, my brother, he was like, hey, you should check out options. I got a guy at work who trades options. He makes a lot of money. You might like it. He goes, I think you'd be good at it. So my first week, I'm like, Shh, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Uh, and so I just buy call options on, Di I'll never forget it, Disney, Alibaba, and Walmart. It was the first three stocks. I was like, I'll buy these call options. I'll go a month out and we'll just see what happens. I had no idea what I was doing. And Disney had earnings that week and went from like 125 to 150. And my Disney options were up $40,000. And I was like, it's not real. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, it's not real. So I close everything. Alibaba's up a thousand. Walmart's up a thousand. I close it all. And I withdraw $40,000. And I'm like, oh my God, like, this is insane. And I did it the next week too. I made $20,000 and I'm like, this is insane. So I was hooked. I was like, this is probably not real reality for me. You know, I got to figure this out and really understand how I can do this. And then I dove into options full, full, like full time. I was like, I'm obsessed. I just made a ton of money in, in a day and I got hooked on it. Um, two years of options buying. I had a very successful and lucky, I would say, career because it, came, it was at the end of the Donald Trump bull market era, right? So, like, all you had to do was buy call options. It was very easy for me. And I wasn't scared to push ten to $20,000 per trade. I was very fortunate, but I think I'm more lucky than I was fortunate or educated or skilled in options trading at the time. Right. Um then I decided to start really branching out into option strategies, and then I found option selling. That was four years ago now, um, and I fell in love with it. I was like, option selling, wow, this seems like I just got lucky all the way up. Now, this is what I can do to preserve that wealth, right? So I switched my gears. I learned everything I absolutely could about covered calls, cash secure puts, credit spreads, and iron condors. And then I even started writing books and guides on it and different strategies and approaches that I was able to take. And now here I am four years later, I'm still full-time trading, selling options for a living. So it's been an adventure. It's been a very stressful six years, but I am very grateful for the place I am now. Definitely where I got to. Now, with the, when you discovered credit spreads and options, you know, selling, yeah, was it something that fit your personality or were you doing that kind of like sort of self-analysis where you were like, I am getting lucky and this isn't sustainable. This is a riding a bull market. And, you know, I assume like the pandemic hit and all of a sudden. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, I'm very self-aware. Come military background, law enforcement. Yeah. I'm very self-aware of myself and my surroundings. So I understood that. I'm probably, it only took me one options buying loss to start exploring. I lost right. $30,000 on Amazon in 2018 Christmas because I was greedy and didn't want to take profits and just kept averaging in. I lost 30 yeah. grand. And that's all it took for me to say, there's got to be something better than this out there. I'm going to blow my, I'm going to blow my, all everything I made. Right. And um, so, yeah, the self-awareness I portion, it fits me. I'm naturally a very extroverted outgoing. I don't want to sit at a computer screen. I can't do it for hours at a time. Um, I have to be moving and, you know, doing things. So when I switched to the spreads, I think I found me, you know, in a strategy. I found that credit spreads and iron condors for me was best fit for how I like to be, which is not in front of a computer screen. I don't, you know, I don't want to be sitting here day trading, anxious, biting my nails. I don't want to do any of that anymore. Well, I want to be more laid back. 
Well, know what's interesting about that point, and I think this is going to be a common uh, refrain on this uh, program, is those that do find themselves wanting to be option sellers, they tend to be the type of person, and I am this type of person too, and even when I was professionally trading as a market maker, is I don't want to be fighting and watching every tick of the market every yeah. day long. Yeah, definitely right? not. And so, And you have to have that kind of personality where you are okay with hitting doubles and instead yep. of home runs, right? Yep. And it's a consistent strategy that that you want to make money over time. And you are going to have those days where it goes wrong. And you got to be cool with that, right? You yeah. have to basically be like, you know what? That didn't work. The probability, I thought the probability was on my side. It wasn't today. And we just move on, right? Yeah, absolutely. When you, when you are in that sort of, um, you know, and this is nothing against those people that are day trading and they are watching every tick and they're playing momentum during the day. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And I've always said that it's a lot on the option side. It's like, if you are long premium, you need everything to go your way and you need to like, you know, time it perfectly and everything like that. It's a lot of work. You're basically, uh, you've got to be on the ball. Whereas when you yeah. are a premium seller, you are basically, uh, to your point, it's like, I'm going to walk away for an hour yeah back and check in on this thing yeah yeah and there so just see so many is so many benefits to selling compared to buying to me i mean it's it's literally a no-brainer now that right. i will not buy options you know when you think about option selling like you said when you're long if you're bought if you're long calls right and weeklies or it doesn't matter the expiration if that underlying asset doesn't go up in a rapid a uh, period of time, right? You're going to lose regardless. Right. And once I really like visualize the chart, if option buyers buy calls, go long, the stock has to go up quickly for them to make money. Right. If they buy shorts and they go add some puts into their contract, you know, and they're, and they're short on stock, they, it has to go down quickly for them to make money. Right. When I visualize this and I saw, okay, as an option seller, if I'm selling calls, it can go up, come down. It can go sideways. It can go up not fast enough and it can go down or down anyway and i will make profits and i'm like okay so now this is a this is a chance of success thing this is a this is an opportunity zone for me here it's like okay so if i just choose correctly and i find out a way to do this I have a much greater chance of success selling options. You know, I always say, don't be the one gambling at the blackjack table, be the dealer, right. be the one that's handing out all those contracts. Right. And that's, there's so many great analogies of how you could be successful options selling. But like you said, if you're, if you're long and that doesn't go long, you're yeah. done for, you got to yeah. move on to the next trade. And there's a weird, uh, weird uh, ego aspect to all of this, right. Which is the, the uh, you're never going to you know be able to go brag to your buddies like oh I sold a iron condor at 35 cents and then I bought it back for 20 cents you know today like I crushed it like people are out you know like if you're gonna go be bragging yeah that's you know, so you're funny to say oh that. I bought this call and it at, at 10 cents and it went to five dollars yep. right the the great retail trader race of I got to get the biggest percentage and a thousand percent gains every yeah. trade or I'm terrible and yeah but I, what you just said is my my bread and butter is 15 cents a contract. I yeah. actually think it's so if someone told that to me, I'd be like, damn, like, nice job. You killed it. Like, yeah. you know, and that's the kind of appreciation that they're looking for. But yeah. you're right. You're not going to get that from an options buyer. Yeah. And you, you know, and again, not to say that this is exactly what everybody should be doing. It takes the, you know, like it takes the the, oh, right yeah. the circumstances you need to kind of be consistent in your strategy and things like that. And people that, you know, I know a lot of people that do options from the, you know, from the buying side, and they are momentum traders, they're chart traders, they're technical traders, they're intraday traders, and it works for them. And so yeah. you know, this is not to say that this is the be all and end all, but like, it, it, you know, let's dive into something, uh, you know, very specific to your style, which yeah. is, you know, I assume you started with cash secured puts, you know, maybe you did some covered calls, maybe you started to do, you know, some credit put spreads or things like mm -hmm. that. But your bread and butter at this point in a lot of ways, well, but I would say it's two things. It's credit spreads, you know, like credit calls, yes. spread, credit put spreads. Yes. And then also iron condors, right? And yep. so talk about the specifics of, and we can sort of, you know, and I can pull up options AI as we chat about this. Yeah. Um, you know, like, so let's say, and you are doing this pretty consistently, not every day of the week, you know, today you mentioned it's an FOMC. Yeah. Day. 
and you're yes, like, I don't, I don't trade on any high importance news days anymore. Yeah, I, I don't think you involved off. in that nonsense, right? Yeah. Right. There's also a stigma, and I see a lot of my people, you know, f- say something like this. They go, "Oh, I'm so bored on the weekend. I can't wait for Monday market to open." And I think that is just the worst. Like, you need to learn to enjoy those downtimes. I see these days now where I'm not trading as like, man, this is the best. It's like, you know, that random day off you got from work and I love it. And that's the mindset that I have now. It took a while to get here. Yeah. Um, but I feel like everyone, if you, if you're trying to be a trader, it's so high stress. I consider it like a law enforcement job and you need to understand that downtime is so important. So days like today, FOMC, I'm like, yes, baby, like taking it off. Well, no, what's interesting is so we're looking at the, you know, at the expected move for today in SPX, right? Yeah. But we're at a half a percent. The Fed meeting, you know, is or the Fed announcement is imminent. And then you've got the Powell press conference and things like getting yep. crazier during the press conference typically, right? So the expected move in the market for a normal day at this low level of volatility has basically been around this level. It's been about 0.4, 0.5, maybe some days 0.6 you are not getting extra reward for taking the chance on this FOMC announcement today. And that's one thing, you know, for the audience to consider. It's like, sometimes there are, you know, maybe you should be selling the CPI day or the Fed meeting day if vol is really high, because it's yeah. putting in this like buffer for you for things to, you know, like to yeah. stay in. But if you are not getting rewarded for that premium sale, to your point, you know, maybe just think about, you know, taking the day off, you know, doing a, doing a webcast with me. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, absolutely. that's something to talk about. So, okay. So now let's, let's assume that this was not a fed day. Let's assume we just walked in in the morning yep. and the market, oh, it's the market unchanged. It's not helped. Okay. Well, let's start with the market unchanged, right? So the market's uh-huh. dead flat. You walk in in the morning. What are you looking at? What is your timing for you know your first trade of the day yeah absolutely so i do trade sbx full-time with my credit spreads that's where i go for sbx obviously it's advantageous with tax benefits with being cash settled over margin and such so i do find that sbx for me is the best underlying asset that i like to use spreads on credit spreads call side put side or iron condors and um, just, first to, thing just to interject on that real quick so the difference between SPX and SPY for the audience, for instance, is SPY, you're obviously, you know, it's a, it's reduced by a hundred, the price, it seems like a, you know, trading in a more normal stock, the strikes are, you know, very uh, easy to understand. However, it is regular options exercise, meaning it's American exercise, meaning that it's traced just like Apple, you can get early assigned, you have to be careful going into expiry. The advan- one of the advantages of SPX yeah. is that it's cash settled and it means that if if a if the SPX finishes in between your strikes, it gets marked as cash. You don't come in in the next morning long a bunch of SPX. You don't have to go down to the docks in Chicago and accept SPX, uh, you know, like you know, anchor, <laughs> right? So yeah. it, it's very different in that you are not assigned. You don't have to worry about exercise. You don't have to worry about early assignment. You know, SPY, for instance, has a dividend this week, and you have to be very careful about early assignment, you know, sort of things like that. So I just wanted to kind of give that background. Yeah, that's a great clarification. And it's so here. important to know that. Yes, yes. Okay, so keep going. Yeah. So first thing I'm going to look at, you know, I don't look at SPY or pre-market level or anything i okay. am a, if i'm using my credit spread strategy on a zero dte x uh, zero days to expiration and i'm trading same day first thing i'm going to look at is about 9 45 a.m eastern i usually wait i'm a 15 minute chart trader and that's where i practiced and that's where i learned and that's where i back tested so i go to the 15 minute chart always and on the 15 minute chart um that's where i'm able to find in 15 minutes into the day my best look on what I what I'm willing to do throughout the day. So even on a day like today, where you see a 0.5 expected move is pretty large when we're sitting at 460, 44, you know. So this um, late in the day. Yeah. yeah, that's late in the day. So with my strategy, I like to sell options away from the you know with the trains moving left, I'm going right. Okay. So that's the basis of my credit spread strategy now that how I would do. So I don't even usually place a trade until about 10, 10, 30, because I'm very consistent with waiting for confirmations, trying to observe if we're going to have a trend day or a chop day. 
a right. chop day will give me the benefit of being able to sell calls or puts and have a higher chance of being successful, right? Because the stock price is probably not going to move too great. Like we're at 1 p.m. Eastern right now and we've moved one, you know, 0.02% on SPX. It's a wonderful day to sell options. But the IV is not dropping and the theta is not really kicking in because we have FOMC in an hour. So right. that's why I take days like today off. But yeah. I like to wait till about 10, 10 30 before I place a trade. I like to go uh, with the momentum. So if the stock price is going up, I'm going to sell put side spreads. If the stock price is going down, I like to sell call side spreads. I like to go with the price action as an option seller. A lot of option sellers that I meet do the opposite and they play into the, the volatility, into the volume of the trend day. And I just think that's dangerous. Um, credit spreads are so high risk. This is so interesting to me. So the, you're basically, your, um, your strategy there is that if the market is opening up a half a percent, it's almost creating a new center of gravity for that day. And I don't know whether, yes. you know, and there's, there's a bunch of things we could get into the weeds on like VWAP and all, you know, intraday, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you're basically saying, okay, this is my new center of gravity. And I'm willing to more oftentimes than not, it, the chance yep. of this market completely reversing and going the other way is not that often. Yeah. So that's a great thing you brought up, like VWAP. Um, I don't use any indicators, yep. zero indicators. Yep. I simply write out the 15 minute opening candle, which is known as the orb candle for some, the opening range breakout candle. And yep. I play the price action of the day. If we have a 0.5% gap up, I would consider that a major gap. Um, yeah. in the price action. And you're going to see a gap like that on the daily chart. Um, and I do take gap trading into consideration with the price action, you know, fading the gap, the gap and go. But around 1030, I'll get a much clearer picture of that. If we begin to fade the gap towards the price action, I absolutely want to be on the call side of that because there's an 84% chance on Thursdays that a gap fails, but on Fridays it's 50-50. So the old statistics then start playing in there for me and gap trading and using that technical analysis. But yes, I reset every single day at 945. That first 15 minute candle is my opening print for the day. And I don't care what happened before that. I don't care where anything else is. And then I know on my charts, the previous lows, the previous lower lows, the previous highs and the previous higher highs. And I chart out the closest major support and resistance levels. And I use that as my entry criteria. And does that entry criteria match the IV for the day, the expected move. Right. And if I'm outside of those boundaries, then I feel comfortable entering a trade. And I like entering at 15 cents. You yeah. know, you were, we were talking about it earlier, like, oh, you know, no one's going to brag about 15 cents. But man, I love it. If I get 20 cents, if I get 20 cents to me, that's a massive day. Like I'm, I'm like happy. Well, think about it. What it is in a percentage, you know, terms, right? Yeah, like absolutely. If you said to somebody that on your options trade, you could make, you know, 50% every day, like from the long, yeah. side, you know how hard that would be. Yeah. So, so the, um, all right. So let's talk about strike selection then. So let's say yep. that's, let's say the SPX opens up uh, a half a percent in the morning. Right. And let's yep. say the expected move is about a half a percent. So that means that the put side, uh, which we were just talking about, the put side expected move for the rest of the day is basically at yesterday's close. Right. It's a gap fill. Correct. Yes. OK, so now what are you what are you doing with that information as far as let's say you're going with a credit put spread to start the day? You know, what is your uh, your. Yeah. Criteria if, for strike? if I were to take a credit put spread on a gap up situation where the implied move is a gap fill. Um, yeah. I would need to see confirmations that the stock is gapping and going and we're having continuing the current uptrend. Yeah. If I don't have confirmations, at least three or four candles that we have a nice uptrend and they're confirmed and, and the market looks bullish, um, I will not be entering a put side. Um, I think it's too dangerous and I would not take a strike price even remotely close to that gap fill. Because as you know, with credit spreads, you can lose so much more than the credit you receive. So if let's just say, yeah, the gap was at 4,600 today, right? Yep. 4,600 is where I would consider to be my stop loss line if we do do a complete gap fill. But I would be looking for more of like the 4,590, 4,580 range. Yep. Where can I sell strikes out of the money completely away and in safe place? Because if 4,600 was the gap fill today, right? I bet if you go down to 45.95 or 45.90, you're going to find that sweet spot, that $20 credit or so, which the premiums are really good today because yeah. of 
the Jerome Powell coming to speak soon, but um, yeah. yeah. So if we had a 4,600 gap fill today, I'm going 4,590 and I'm using 4,600, the gap fill as my stop loss line. Okay. And then when you're, let's say, you know, you're picking your short strike level, you know, yep. like we're talking about, and then how are you thinking about your width? Are you always consistently doing five, 10 or? Do you yeah. Know? Yeah. So the width, there's a great, you know, there, there's, there's only a few factors in width, right? Obviously the number one factor is collateral needed to enter the trade five wides, $500 because, um, you're selling a strike price five away from each other. Um, every, every $1, the strike price is So for on SPX, the minimum is five. You have to have $500 to sell one credit spread on SPX at a minimum. Yep. On other underlying stocks like SPY, you have a $1 spread on the strike price. So you're able to sell one credit spread or iron condor for $100. Right. Um, going to SPX 10 wide, you would you know be $1,000 per trade. Um, I feel like having a further out of the money back leg, if I were to do a 4,600, 4,590, you'll see that there's more gain there, but it's actually less total gain. Right? right. So you go to you jump to 120 on the profits there, but it's really you're putting 500 more in just to get an additional what 40 bucks fi or 55 well, bucks. What's interesting is, yeah, you know, you got 70. There's that 70. So you're, you're getting 50 runs. more bucks for an additional 500. Yeah, um, I think that it's, right. yeah. It's yeah. less volatile. Um, you know, you see a spike towards the direction that back leg will keep the volatility low. It's quicker to expire worthless. So there's some benefits there. I, I, Started off my spread career with minimum width. So for SPX, that'd be five. I recently tested 10 wide for a few months and it was good. Um, yeah. I did less contracts. Um, the collateral was just as big. The stop losses were good. And I noticed that the stock, the credit spread price didn't jump and fluctuate as much. So I like that for a while. Right. Um, I've recently gone back to five wide. Five wide for me, especially options AI has, is one of the the top ones in this. When you When you don't, Blows the credit spread when you let it expire worthless. Let's just say that stock price doesn't even come close to 4,600. You're not at any risk for the day. I mean, it just goes through the roof to 4,675. You're good. You're going to make 100% gains most likely. It's it's not impossible that you lose. It's improbable at this point. At that point, I let my contracts expire worthless always. I go for the expiration and because of brokers like Options AI where there's no commissions on those expired contracts. And right. that's huge. That yep. is huge for someone like me who's trading 30, 40, 50 contracts a day. And that adds up significantly for me over time. I consider it a profit, you yeah. know, ex letting a contract expire worthless. I consider that profit. So um, that's now, one of the huge benefits here. And let's, and, and then you obviously do not have to worry, not that in that scenario at max gain, you would have to worry about a, an assignment or anything. Um, yeah. let's get to okay so let's run through this scenario where you know and again we're, we're kind of making things up here because we're looking at yeah. that it's completely unchanged but let's say we did get that gap higher you kind of um you know you did that credit put spread let's go through two scenarios really quickly so the yeah. one is the market just keeps going higher it ends up like 0.7 percent on the day you let your put spread you're letting your put spread ride as you just mentioned you're you know you're taking it to expiry it's going to be max gain are you doing anything on the call side? Are you doing anything, you know, like the, the market's continued higher, it stayed strong? Or yeah. You're pretty much your play for the day. Or are you legging into an iron condor or anything at that point? So if that's a great question, I actually do have two strategies for this reason. And that's for that exact reason. So my zero TDE strategy that I practice and I, I use daily when I'm trading, um, it would just call for a put side. If we gap up and we continue on a gap and go, why jeopardize and put into the the, put yourself in front of the train Out of now right yeah now let's say we gap up 0.5 percent and the opening 15 minute print is another 0.2 percent and with yeah. it by 11 a.m we're up 1.2 percent on the day right. now we come into a realm where i like to call this a statistical based entry in 2023 intraday we have not had a larger move intraday did you know this than 2.28 percent yeah. that's the max of this year which is a pretty low volatile year thinking the massive crazy swings and upswings we've had and down, there's not been one day higher than 2.28%. Yep. So then I look at what got to 2% this year, less than 1.7% of all trading days. Okay, what got to 1.75%? And I take these previous data, statistical-based days and entries, then I would say, hey, the market's up 1.2%. The last 19 times this happened throughout the year, none of them closed above 1.7%. 
Let's look at 1.7%, see what the strikes are paying. And if they're paying 15 cents or more, I think it's okay to enter a statistical based entry with risk management on, right? You got to have a good stop loss. If you're making newer high after newer high, why are you going to sit in front of the freight train like that? You know, so having a nice stop loss and entry and exit criteria governing that type of trade um, is key, is definitely key because as we said a hundred times, it's so high risk selling spreads. Um, but a statistical based entry on the call side there would be a lot more beneficial than just playing some regular, you know, strike that has good premium. So I would let my put side go to exp expiration and then I would take my chances with a statistical based entry based right. on previous SBX data. And then I would possibly enter a call side. But if it just kind of staggered around 46, four, you know, four zero to 46, seven zero, yeah. I would just take the put side profits and I wouldn't overtrade. That's really cool. And so what is your sort of, um, what is your time limit like through the day using Eastern time as an example? Yeah. Like where would you not bother with that? Like, is it? Yeah. So a statistical yeah. based entry, I have entered as late as 3 45 PM. Okay. So you where the market was it. down 2% on the day. And I was like, wow, yeah. I don't think it's going to fall another 0.1%, which is, you know, on a red day, those premiums are still very high with 15 minutes left. It's and true. so there's no time frame for me on a statistical based entry. However, a my normal strategy of playing again with the trend on, you know, far away, if we get to the 1130 noon part and I wasn't able to make an entry at that point, I would start considering an iron condor for the day. And I wouldn't even play. So if we're six, seven candles in on a 15 minute chart, you know, we're about to go into our second hour of the trading day and we're still within that 15 minute print. I would look to maybe open an iron condor. If the iron condor doesn't have the strikes on both sides that I feel comfortable entering um, for a statistical and mathematical, you know, I'd like to be over one standard deviation on all entries. And yeah. if it doesn't present that, I simply won't trade for the day. Yeah. And I want to actually, before we get to iron condors and that we're going to do that next, yep. I want to pause on something you just said, which is kind of interesting. And it's something I always try to remind traders. Um, you are taking advantage when you mentioned that 345 trade, you are taking advantage of something that's very interesting from the market maker side of things, which was my old job, right? Which is theta and the decay of options yeah, is, you know, most people know it to go like this, and then it steepens and steepens and steepens into expiration, except for the last little bit part of it, right? Correct. At the end, it kind of goes like this. And there's a reason for that is the market makers have no benefit to sell things at, at two pennies, right? Just because there's only 10 minutes left in the trading deck. So it sort of gets stopped at some point. Flattens out. Yep. You can watch this. Just pull up a you know an options chain or whatever into expiration. You're going to see this happening where there's a little bit left in those straddles. I mean, spy straddles and all. Ex they expire at 415 with premium on them. Yeah, that is is that that's people. That's the market makers saying it's not you know I I'm not going to get rich selling stuff at two cents right, and I'm I'm only going to get picked off right. And so that's just an interesting thing where you're taking advantage of that. And what I always say on the flip side of that is if you are selling something, for instance, in the morning or whatever, and you are selling it at that really cheap, you know, picking pennies up off the train tracks type levels, yep. you basically have to live with that trade through expiration because you're never going to get a chance to take it off. Like if you sell <laughs> Correct. eight cents, yeah. you better be right because, what, you know, you're going to check in 15 minutes before the close and it's going to be offered at six cents, even if you are completely right. Right. Correct. So, so that's like, I, I just wanted to mention that real quick, because I think that's really helpful. And some people get confused on expiration. They're like, why isn't my thing worthless? And it's like, because it's a bid ask and nobody's yes. willing to sell it at worthless, right? Correct. They'd um, rather just, yeah, they'd rather just they'd rather let it just, run. They'd be like, plug me with, plug my one cent bid all day, but I ain't selling anything. Yeah, I ain't, I'm not opening any short for anything under six cents or whatever. Yeah. And so the, anyway, that's what's going on. And that's a little inside baseball. So now let's go. Oh, I wanted to ask you one more question. Okay, so let's say the market opens. It opens up, um, uh, you know, a half a percent. Like we said, you put on that credit put spread. The market reverses and it starts yeah. coming towards your credit put spread. You're you're worried. W what's your thinking? And at what point do you bail? And at what point do you sort of say this? I'm not bailing on this thing. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's like, what's the risk management with the strategy? Great. First of all, we're being worried. I, I feel like has no place in this profession. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. So I would never get worried. I would just be like, eh, I'm going to take a loss today. You know, you right. accept it. You diffuse the situation in your mind and you have a great, I have a great understanding of it's okay to take a loss. It's going to happen. And I understand that. So if I saw it, I'd be like, I'm going to take a loss. Got it. Um, if it were to continue downtrending, um, it really depends on the aggression of the downtrend, the volume, the, you know, the, how quickly we're de the depth of that fall. Are we free falling? Or are we slowly climbing in our grave? You know, so that has a bit of impact on the, on the bid ask as well. Uh, volatility in an IV will spike tremendously on a downfall. So you're going to most likely get burned out of those contracts quitter. I have a stop loss contingency that I personally use on my against my collateral. So if I were to have ten thousand dollars of collateral into a trade, I will never, ever, ever put myself at risk to lose more than thirty percent of what my collateral is. That's my own personal okay. max stop loss. Okay. So if at nine thirty five we fall fifteen points and then nine forty we're down another ten, and then the second candle is another, we get thirty points of the of the point five percent filled on SPX in the first thirty minutes. I'm most likely going to get stopped out already right then and there. Take the max loss. It is what it is. It doesn't matter to me if it would have been 100% gain. It doesn't matter to me if it would have been a max loss. None of that matters at that point. The point is that I followed my trading plan. Yep. If it is descending slowly towards my strike prices, then I'm going to let Theta work midday. I'm going to let the lunch hour come. If we don't have a, like a strong stop loss point, that has been hit a zone that I like to use. I actually mark the chart and say, this is my zone support and resistance is zones. It's not just a clear number unless it's a psychological number, like 4,600, 4,500. So when I see these zones, I wait for 15 minute confirmations to exit my trades the same way I used 15 minute confirmations to enter my trades. A lot of traders exit when a stock underlying stock hits a price. All right. So for if SBX hits 4610 right now, I'm out. That's how they think. And I think that's wrong. I think you need to wait for confirmations that 4610 is not going, it's not going to go back above that. And there's really no way to tell unless you watch it for 15, 30 minutes and how it reacts around those price points. Right. So if I were to hit my max loss, it is what it is. And I'm on to the next one. If it were to slowly go though, I would hold until my zone is, once my zone is broken and now that level of support has become a resistance level. I would probably say, okay, I'm in more trouble now with a with a consistent trend day downtrend, and I'll take my loss here, which could be significantly less than the three thousand dollar, you know, thirty percent of the collateral. So there's some days where I'll close a trade at three forty five p.m. I'm not going to yeah. gamble it and hit my zone. There's some days where you know the ones that hurt the most are the ones where it happens quickly, ten thirty, eleven thirty a.m. Eastern. It's fallen, you know, thirty forty points. In which the equivalent on SPX 30, falling 30, 40 points is spy falling three or four dollars in a half hour. And you're burned. You're burned. You're going to lose what I would say my max loss. I'm going to take it and I'm going to drive on from there. Okay. There's not a there's a lot of times that this happens. It's a lot. It's a lot more frequent than you think. I always say my kryptonite in the market is a strong trend reversal because yeah. if the market's going down, 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 I'm selling calls, selling calls. I'm with the market and then boom. FOMC hits, Jerome Powell says something and the market goes up 40 points. Yep. I'm burned. And yep. you just accept your fate. You know, you understand that I back tested. Like the reason I'm not trading today is because in my back testing, my chance of success was significantly less on high importance news days yep. than it was on a non news day. And so I'm just going to give myself that little edge as yep. best as I possibly can. We can and so i'm um, taking the loss as part of the game anything options is extremely high risk probably the most high risk high risk financial instrument in all of markets is options and derivatives yeah. um i understand that and i all i like to govern my trades with tight strict law um stop losses and risk management so yeah. gonna take my losses but i'm gonna take them in stride i'm gonna do whatever i can to continue the strategy yep and it's um uh, it, well it's interesting with the volatility right because, you know, the, if you're a vol trader, which a lot of people are, and I would say with, when you're within a week or two weeks or even three weeks, you are not vol trading. You're not Vega trading generally. There are instances where obviously like after an earnings event or something like that, you kind of are vol trading. But we, what you're really doing is expected move trading, which is the difference between implied volatility in the options market and realized volatility. And you're going to find out real quick 
if they were a match, right? And so that doesn't matter if the VIX yeah. is 13 or 30. It's just a comparison of those two things. If you are trading, you know, people say sell high ball and buy low ball. That's not how it works on a short time frame. That only works if you're going out like four months and you sell high ball, it mean reverts. Correct. Everybody's cool. But in this scenario, you're really talking about the realized ball, you know, the way we're talking about, does the market move 0.5% today or 0.75% today? And what's the options? What are options pricing? It's break evens, it's yep. moves within ranges and things like that. So I want to get to iron condors. And yeah. I was, it was funny when you were talking, I was saying that it's going to be up to the audience to figure out whether Max, when he says max loss and max gain, whether he's talking about maximum or himself. <laughs> um, so let's Good move luck. to Iron Condor. So let's talk about, you know, and, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, but I kind of want to dive into this a little bit deeper, is your Iron Condor strategy. So let's just go to neutral. Um, are you doing that mostly on days where you do get an unchanged open? Or, you know, like, what is your thinking there? So let's say the yeah. market comes in and it's completely unched or barely moving pre-market, yep. you know, 945, you get in. Yep. Are you now in an iron condor mindset? Uh, no, not no. for me. I think iron condor mindset, I need to see more price action. I need to eliminate okay. the, the an iron condor will only lose on a trend day. And a trend day is what we need to eliminate, right? If we can put the, the statistics in our favor, then an iron condor has a higher chance of success because the initial entry may say we have a 20 delta and an 80 percent chance of success but obviously delta is as fluid as the underlying stocks price changing every dollar so it's right. it's it's gonna change um i do not think iron condor should be opened right at right at entry because you have to try and decipher the fact of is this going to be a trend day or not and if it's not going to be now i have an iron condor mindset so I've, as i previously mentioned before if there's no clear trend an hour and a half to two hours in the day, now I have an iron condor mindset. One of my favorite strategies is if my opening range, whether it be to the gap fill or just the opening range, if the underlying, if the price of SPX cannot break that range for an hour and a half to two hours, we're in a consolidation period at that point, intraday yeah. at least, right? So then I would say, okay, I like an iron condor here, but is that consolidation period going to lead to a larger than expected breakout move with volume? Or is it just going to consolidate through the day and maybe tomorrow we're going to have that trend day breakout? So you have to always take on that risk of when you enter an iron condor. And a lot of times you will see that trend break at 1, 2 p.m. and iron condor is no longer safe. You're going to wind up taking a loss. Yeah. So for me, the biggest factors are, is it a trend day? And if I can wait an hour and a half and say it's pretty choppy, I yep. think, okay, this is good. Or does the chop make a move, but then maybe we drop 30 points in the first 10 minutes and yep. then we start chopping around, right? So I always wait an hour and a half to two hours and then I want to get rid of that trend day factor. Next, is this a consolidation move until a volume breakout? Really no way to tell that unless you're uh, drawing out some good technical analysis. And if I saw that SPX or SPY was in like some sort of bullish pattern and it's looking to break out, then I would most likely just close the condors call side at that point and just take the profits on the put side. Yeah. So I'm always following those along um, iron condors. I set alerts, very close price action alerts. If we have a newer high or newer low, then I am able to manage the trade without sitting in front of my desk all day. But iron condors, I think the most important thing is understanding the trend or not. Um, and then I have a secondary strategy that I like to use for iron condors where I always open a one day to expiration. So I'll open up an iron condor for tomorrow yep. without anything else besides option AI's dashboard where, yep. and I, I know that sounds crazy, but I use option AI's dashboard in the percentage of success. As I said earlier, I like trading above one standard deviation and there's certain ways you can trade. Right, just like you have on the on the screen right now. And I think having a 69% chance of success just above one standard deviation, yep. 215 for a 285 risk, you're going to see more times than not throughout the year of, of the trading day of a lesser than expected move. Oh, 
over, so when the over IV over a day and a half to two days, right? Over the day and a half to two days, the most I believe that you'll see larger than expected moves where the IV and the expected move for the day calculator just gets blown out of the water. I think you're only going to see that. And I know this sounds crazy, four to seven days max ever in a period, because the more volatile the market becomes, the further these strike prices are for us, right? That 68% chance of success is a, um, what is it? A short call, 46.10. So it's 35 spread right now, but yeah. on a day where the president's getting elected, it might be a 60 spread, right? It might be 70 and you're getting the same premium. So it moves with that IV, which yeah. is nice. If the IV is as fluid as the strike prices, then all I really need to do is keep that chance of success, that POP the same. Yep. And that's where I like to trade as well on my one DTE strategy. I open up a 70 wide spread condor every single day sometimes. Yep. So this is a scenario where you're basically, um, you're doing it centered exactly where the stock is for the next you know, day and a half or something like that. Going yep. back to the one day intraday strategy, the market yep. opens up a half a percent. It, it, kind of gets rejected and let's say the expected move was a half a percent that day it kind of not rejected but you know what i mean it pulls back a little yeah. bit it's getting choppy it's now up uh 0.3 percent and you kind of feel like all right this is going to be a chop day i want to do an iron condor are you doing it from that exact level as well there like you're doing it from the up 0.3 percent level is your set. yes Okay. With the guideline yep. and the rule for myself and my standardized strike price choosing, whatever, I am going to open it at the current price of SPX, not where it opened. But yep. I'm going to take into consideration that gap fill because yep. I'm not going to ever choose. I have done it in the past. I can't say I'm never actually going to do this. I, I have done it in the past where when you have a gap and go day, sometimes you by the time I go to enter, the gap fill premiums are zeroed out. They're yep. already completely worthless. So then I start scrolling up my strikes to try and find the best next strike price where I feel comfortable. And if it doesn't match like a safe point of analysis for me, I don't want to enter the trade at all. I'll say, you know what? We missed the move today. Let's right. see if we get a statistical based entry later on in the day, possibly. Uh, but uh, it's nothing wrong with saying, you know what? I just missed the move. It moved too quick. Um, so then I would still open my iron condor, my, my zero DT right based on the underlying spread uh, on the stock. But if one of the legs wasn't, you know, if I wasn't able to hit that right strike price, then I would just enter one leg at that time. Yep, that is that is really interesting. So I'm going to wrap it up here. I think we've covered, right. we've covered credit, credit put spreads, credit call spreads, one day, two day. Do you, Now, do you do anything longer term or are you pretty much- I used to um, back when SPX and SPY didn't have daily contracts. It was Monday, Wednesday, Friday prior to that. Yep. And then I would do my, instead of you know one DTE, I would do a two DTE and I would open up at Monday close for Wednesday and Wednesday close for Friday. Um, and I had a very, same, very similar system there where uh, I think that if we saw two- or one larger than expected move by Monday to Wednesday, yep. then I would play my, my iron condor, you know, and I'd go based off of, off of the IV, which you guys visualize now for me. So it's wonderful. Um, right. But that's exactly how I did it. And even prior to that, I remember trading when we were at weeklies. I remember when they just got weeklies and I was, everyone was, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, and I used to do weeklies on underlying stock. Um, a few major losses will change your mind on weeklies very quickly. Right. You know, yep. you know, you, uh, there's nothing more dangerous in the options world than swing trading for a reason, because the the unknown, the unforeseen events and anything that could happen while the market is closed, which is what I went through. My largest loss to date ever with options was an unforeseen event while I was holding a credit spread. Right. Um, and I'll never forget it. It was when Costco hit all time high. I was in call side co uh, Costco credit spreads, uh, call side, and uh, they release earnings in the middle of the night for some reason out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> they said, you know what? And they literally let off the conference with our three. earnings are so good that yeah, we just we got to release them three weeks early. I kind of remember that. Costco yep. went from five hundred and fifty dollars to six hundred and ten the next day. Yeah. And yep. I was in five hundred and seventy five call sides. And by the time I woke up, I was near max loss. And yep. I was like, oh, my God, you want to vomit. You want you feel sick. And you're like. After that, I said, you know what? I bet you there's something better than weeklies. <laughs> then you start digging into SPY, QQQ, IWM. Then you say, you know what? They came out with zero DTEs. Let's try and refine a strategy to scalping, you know, to day trading. And that's where I've 
I've got my most success from. So I'm a firm believer. If it ain't broken, don't try and fix it. Don't reinvent what's the wheel, you know? So yeah. it's working for me and I'm going to stay where I'm comfortable working. You know, I've, I've, I've been burned on weeklies time value and swinging, man, you know, even the one DT, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think, I think that's that's just an easy way for me to stay risk adverse is if I stick to those zero DTEs and the one DT, which is the opposite for options buyers, right? They say zero DTEs and you're like, oh shit, that, that's high risk. I can't, you know, I'm not going to mess with that. But as a seller, I'm like, yeah, sounds pretty nice to be in a trade for five hours, you know, and, and have a high chance of success, 80, 90% every time. It makes sense to me. Yeah, and what you're doing is you're repeating the behavior over and over and over again. Yep. And you're you're basically getting uh, instant gratification isn't the word, but you're getting um, you know proof of concept every day. Yes, than, like if you're a 45 DTE premium seller, right? Like that's you know you're only get to do that you know what eight nine times a year, right? Yeah, that's your strategy if, where you're getting there, feedback yeah. every single day of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. There's certain days where. I look at time as a valuable asset yeah. for our options selling, right? There was just a recent period where the S&P 500 had hit three red months in a row. Yeah. And the S&P 500, I don't think has ever had four red months in a row, or it's been such a long time ago. So something like that, then putting a put side credit spread saying, you know what? I don't think we're going to have a fourth red month. I'm going to, I'm going to play the entire 30 day month. And I think we're going to go green. You know, something like that would pay such a hefty amount of premium for a pretty good risk to reward ratio. And I could see the value there. I really, I could see the value of doing something like that. Um, but for me as a day trader, getting the, you know, the the same dopamine that the the buyers get, I like to be in the game, zero DT, one DT now. But I do see the value of where time, if the data made sense, yeah, you know, and the market right now let's just say the market right now what if we explode past all-time high in the next week yep. what if we went up 400 500 700 points on spx in a matter of three or four weeks right. that's an unheard of rally now i would start looking at larger time frames on the weekly chart and maybe playing a monthly call side makes sense the risk to reward right so there's always i never let my personal bias or my opinion get in the way of a potential trade that could be profitable. Mm -hmm. And that's a, the example you just gave, a, a perfect example of that because you get the reward of high volatility is if you've just had a big downtrend. Yeah. You don't know exactly where it's going to end, but you know it ends at some point. You know, the market's not going to go to zero. Correct. So, you know, you might want to like buy time, do a big, fat, meaty credit put spread mm -hmm. out, you know, like at 30 days and be like, you know, I'm going to close my eyes. I think the market's going to bottom at some point soon, but I don't know. Yeah. Why. You know, that kind absolutely. of thing is worded for the high wall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, Max, this was great. Thanks so yeah. much for being on. This was really cool. And so you can find Max at Max Options Trading on YouTube. And then what are you, uh, some of the other channels? Like what you were mentioning, the Insta is slightly different. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we got a decent, uh, nice social community on Instagram. It's Max Options Trading. Um, I'm also very active on Twitter, uh, where you can find me at Max Options Trade. They don't allow, the ING doesn't fit. So it's at Max Options Trade. But the rest of my socials is all at Max Options Trading if you want to find me connect, link up, send me a message. Even if you just have a question about options trading, I'm more than willing to help anyone at any time. And what's, you know, and again, what's cool about Max is it, it's a community, right? And they're talking about the, you know, they're sharing strategies and they're sharing experiences, they're sharing like back testing and things like that. And they're basically, yeah. you know, that's what's really cool about some of these options communities um, where it's, you know, like options traders are slightly nerdier. It's not going to be, a, you know, like it's not going to be like a lot of, uh, oh, man, you know, like chest pounding necessarily no. it's like, oh, man, I got burned on this thing. I learned my lesson. What 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 have, what's your guys experience been in this? You know, and that's what's kind of cool. And Max has that kind of community where they're, you know, they're talking, they're talking experiences. They're talking, uh, you know, have you guys tried this strategy? Um, so it's and that's the important part that I find of a community, especially in a high stressful field, right? That's why you see so much camaraderie in the and camaraderie in the in the military and the police forces is because when you live in these high stress environments, which yeah. we are, we're not using our physical side, but we are using our mental stress side, like all throughout the day. Yeah. And I think it's important to find like minded individuals in communities that are going through the same process as you, you yeah. know, and that's one thing that when we started MOT, and we were we were like, let's build a community around what we love. 
option selling, right? Let's yeah. let's see what we can build and, you know, help people get to the same level we are. You know, when I, I always look for a mentor myself, when I was real estate investing, when I got in options, I found someone who I wanted to be, who's successful at it and who's made all the mistakes stakes and who could help me get to that next level, right? Just like a mastermind program. Um, and I think that seeing a community of people, like when you're, when you're getting smoked, I mean, there's nothing better. There's nothing that makes me happier that I just got burned. I lost thousands of dollars and I post it and I say, I just got smoked today. And then 50 people reply either, you'll get it back. We're not worried. You're the man. What'd you do wrong? What'd you do right? And it's just a learning experience for everybody. Yep. And that's the most important piece, right? If you want to get better, you got to learn from your mistakes. And yeah. that's what a community provides most of everything. Like-minded individuals who all want to grow together. And, and that's always, that's what I like about I've it. always used the comparison. You've got to be comfortable with missing the game-winning shot and getting yeah. over it, right? And that's yeah. like, or else you're going to go crazy, you know? So, <laughs> literally, and literally. Then make, and then you make bad decisions. It, you know, like it, it's it's all like that kind of level-headed Yep. So Max, thanks so much. And, um, you know, uh, check out Max's channels, check out his community. And thanks so much for being on the show. Absolutely. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. It was great. And uh, we'll chat soon. I really hope you enjoyed that interview with me and one of the owners of Options AI, the hottest new broker out. I'm telling you, if you guys enjoyed this, if you really like what they're bringing to the table and you like what Big Daddy Max is bringing to the table, then do not forget to check out that link below. Zero commissions for the first month is unbeatable. Who wants a $3 stock when you can get free commissions? Check out Options AI. Let me know what you think in the comments below.